Hello, everybody. This is Lucia Hendor from the NHGRI. Welcome to the CSER II pre-application informational webinar. There are a number of NIH staff here in the room with me and others who may be joining on the phone, but in the interest of time, we won't, we won't be going through introductions, but rest assured that we have um, a number of folks here who are able to answer your questions. Okay, so I'm going to be starting off with a very short overview of the CSER II program and its goals. Um, for today, let me point out that at the top of the slide that I'm showing here is the link to the NHGRI page where hopefully you found the dial-in information for this webinar, as well as the link to the FAQs that we have posted and will continue to update. As a matter of etiquette for your other fellow callers, please keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question. To unmute during the Q&A, click the mic and you should be unmuted. Um, and then please remember to remute yourself after you have a chance to talk. So again, don't, don't unmute now, but when we're ready for questions, um, that's what you'll need to do. Okay, so let me point out that um, we are all here today to discuss the CSER II program. Our intention is to give a high-level overview of the CSER II RFAs. I'm showing you the three RFAs here, the two clinical site RFAs, as well as the coordinating center RFA, as well as the links. Hopefully, you're all here because you have some um, familiarity with the RFAs and have had a chance to look them over. Um, and I want to mention that even though we'll be discussing the high-level um, RFA goals and answering questions, the RFAs are the official source of information. So let me go in a little bit into what we um, intend when, we, when the NIH released requests for application. So RFAs serve multiple goals. And so when you hear us answer questions about them, um, we may be answering from a number of different perspectives. First of all, they are instructions to applicants, as you're well aware of. They also serve as guidance to reviewers. So there's information and criteria for reviewers to consider as they're evaluating the ap applications. For grantees that will be funded as part of CSER II, there are terms and conditions and expectations um, for grantees. And then also the high-level um, goals of um, the NIH, the NHGRI, the NCI, the NIMHD um, are sort of folded in, as well as a um, retrospective and, and sort of descriptive history of CSER um, I, which is currently ongoing and wrapping up. I want to make a distinction, and, and those of you who have um, talked with, with us um, may remember this, but distinguishing between the responsiveness to the RFA and scientific merit. So the RFA sets out a number of fairly high-level goals, and program staff can help guide applicants as to whether the proposed work seems to be broadly responsive to the goals. However, program is not really the best suited for addressing very specific um, questions of scientific merit, such as the approaches used, um, you know, for, uh, for example, comparing two very technical methods. Some of those details that are more granular are best left to peer review. So please keep that in mind as, as you ask and we answer your questions. We are looking for your best ideas. We're all very excited about this RFA, and so um, we hope that as you read the RFA and respond to it, you'll keep all these things in mind. So one key thing I want to emphasize is that CSER II has a, an important um, kind of um, site-specific as well as consortium overview. So taking a look at this picture of this orchestra making beautiful music, you'll of course recognize that there are many different types of instruments, the strings, the woodwinds, the brass, the percussion that go into making this orchestra. Um, and of course, it's very important that the violinists are technically technically proficient in their own way um, as for the other instruments. And so hopefully it's not too much of a stretch to um, um, say that each CSER II site that will be funded is in fact part of a whole. Each site will bring its unique strengths and approaches and investigative team um, to this um, consortium. But of course the consortium itself as a whole is a critical mass of investigators as well as stakeholders that will address the key goals of the RFA. Um, and, and of course the hope is that it's more than the sum of its parts. So now let me transition into the, um, the high-level goals of the RFA. So I'll walk through them in turn. So the first is clinical utility. Um, we are using the broad definition that's in this um, 
publication cited here from the ACNG, um, which is genomic, does genomic intervention lead to imp an improved health outcome? Um, really going beyond diagnosis and, and also including implications for family members um, as well as um, kind of downstream and, and health utilization outcomes as well as clinical outcomes. So the, in the most broadest sense, um, one of the key goals of CSER II is to define, generate, and analyze evidence regarding the clinical utility of genome sequencing. Each site will propose site-specific measures, and CSER II will also come together and agree on consensus measures of clinical utility. The clinical sites will each bring um, 1,100 participants or more as a minimum um, to the table. So I want to clarify, and this is um, also on the FAQ, that the 1100 is a minimum across all study design components um, and also including retrospective data. And then another um, final feature of this aim is a comparison of genome sequencing, which we've defined in the RFA, to alternative modalities. Um, the idea here is that in order for us to um, assess the clinical utility of genome sequencing, it's, it's um, often very helpful to have a comparison approach. A second high-level aim of CSER II is research at the intersection of the, the domains that you see here. Our experience in CSER I um, and knowledge of the field suggests that there are critical interactions among these different domains that influence implementation of clinical genomic sequencing. Um, so applicants will describe how their proposed research um, takes advantage and, and proposes to answer questions. Um, related to these domains and how their proposed research might generalize to other sites or settings. It's important to recognize that we, ha um, we are starting to get a handle on a number of two-way interactions. So, for example, the interactions between patients and practitioners, but going beyond those two-way interactions um, for the next um, four years of CSER II will be critical, as will the, um, the tie-in of these domains to diversity goals, which are described in the RFA, as well as health disparities. A third aim of CSER II is addressing real-world barriers to integrating genomic, clinical, and healthcare utilization data within a healthcare system for the purpose of clinical decision-making. So in our concept clearance where we presented the, um, the high-level goals of this concept to our NHGRI Council, we described a number of areas um, which you see here represented in the figure, genomic, clinical, and healthcare utilization. Um, the bullets are examples, and what we did was we sort of described how these data types tend to be siloed. So, for example, it's, it's very difficult um, and challenging to link genomic to high-quality phenotype data. So um, addressing these real-world barriers and addressing the data integration as part of CSER II will be critical in, to, in making sure that CSER II data contribute to an evidence base that will be helpful for clinical decision-making. And so we're envisioning this aim as somewhat of a pilot, um, so we, have, we recognize that there are different challenges um, and um, advantages of doing so in different settings. And so um, the RFA describes a little bit about what we expect in terms of um, this pilot. Um, and as part of, part of that, um, you know, this aim has somewhat of a many flowers bloom approach, and I think, you know, the different groups will come up with slightly different approaches, but we will encourage interoperability of processes, standards, and best practices um, across CSER sites and, and with external healthcare systems is feasible. And I also want to mention as part of this goal, um, we, we anticipate that CSER II will be in a great position to contribute to existing resources um, that are doing similar work, such as ClinGen. I'm going to now turn this over to Dave Kaufman to talk a little bit about the LC expectations. Thanks, Lucia. So as many of you know, uh, LC stands for the ethical, legal, and social implications of uh, implementing uh, uh, clinical genomics in this in, uh, in this case. And um, so the CSER II applications uh, uh, must address some of the LC some LC research questions. Uh, simply addressing human subjects concerns that come up uh, in the in the other objectives that uh, that Lucia described uh, will not be uh, judged to be responsive. Um, but you know we we believe that there are tons of great uh, LC research opportunities uh, across all three aims. Um, we think uh, there is some flexibility uh, in, in the degree to which applicants emphasize the LC within each, each of the aims. Um, and uh, for those of you who are aware of the structure of CSER I applications, uh, LC sort of had its own separate project there, and uh, that uh, structure is not being required. You don't have to write your LC as a sort of separate part of the application. Uh, on the other hand, 
you certainly can do that. Um, um, we expect that LC research will, in CSER two, will go beyond issues of, uh, of consent and the return of research results uh, and, and measuring sort of psychosocial outcomes of returning uh, results to people. Um, and of particular interest to us um, is research that will help ensure the utility of genomics uh, as it gets uh, uh, implemented in diverse populations in healthcare settings beyond academic medical uh, uh, centers and in ways that address and, and don't exacerbate health disparities. Uh, you know, and with respect to this last bullet point, you know, some of this work uh, may indeed be oriented towards identifying problems that exist as we implement clinical genomics more broadly, but we do hope that some of the work will be oriented towards uh, some problem solving to sort of, you know, try and get at some, some of those issues. Back to you. Lucia. Okay, thanks, Dave. Sure. Um, so that was Elsie. Another important component of CSER II will be getting input from key stakeholders, which we've described in the RFA as including professional societies, payers, regulatory agencies, and patient groups. And this is this is um, you know a somewhat expanded and more focused effort in CSER II to engage these stakeholders um, in in helping define and be responsive to. Uh, metrics and clinical utility, and, and really um, any issues that come up related to um, genomic sequencing and, and the integration of it into clinical care. So I think we recognize that today in 2016, we may have an idea of what the landscape may look like in four years, but we may not, you know, be able to recognize everything that comes up. And of course, we want to position CSER II to be responsive to evolving needs for data and evidence. Um, after all, this will be the clinical sequencing evidence um, generating research consortium. And so applicants will be expected to develop site-specific stakeholder engagement plans and um, describe their potential contributions to a CSER II-wide engagement plan. The Coordinating Center RFA describes um, some expectations for the Coordinating Center to help facilitate the development of this um, consortium-wide engagement plan. And an important thing to keep in mind is, as you think about these plans is to um, consider the value of engaging stakeholders throughout the entire research process from the study design to the implementation of findings. Okay, so that's um, basically it for our short overview. Um, I want to remind people that we do have this FAQ up um, at this webpage. It's the same page that we cited in the notice in the NIH guide. Um, the archive of this webinar will also be posted there for um, colleagues of, of yours or the community um, who aren't able to make it today. So there are three scientific contacts listed in the RFA. I'm, I'm one of them. Um, I also have colleagues from the NCI and NIMHD here, and I, I just want to give them a chance to say anything if there's anything they want to chime in with. Sure. Um, quick introduction. Oh, sorry. So I'm Charlize Kagan, and I'm based in uh, NCI's Epidemiology and Genomics Research Program, and we've been very fortunate to be um, part of CSER one and now CSER two. So everything that, um, for all cancer projects, everything for CSER still applies, but if you have cancer-specific questions, it might be best to um, get in touch with us for your concerns. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Charlize. Um, so, I think we are coming to the end of our overview. Um, I do want to go through a couple of questions that we received in advance um, as you are gathering your thoughts. Um, as, as you're preparing to ask questions, however, if, if you could um, try to keep them as general as possible to allow for as many questions um, as, we, as we can to, to get answered today. Um, we recognize that people may be interested in um, sharing the details of their study designs, um, and you know that's, that's appropriate to some degree, but if people have very, very specific questions, they may want to consult with us offline so we can answer those specific questions. Okay, so um, one of the questions that we have gotten um, is, whether um, clinical utility, um, the clinical utility aim should focus on a single disease entity or multiple disease entities. So what is the best approach? And I want to show people um, a link to the, um, the, uh, the uh, FAQ. Let's see. Can we get that up? The frequently asked. Okay. Um, where we've, we've started to address this. Um, this is a question that we've heard. So. Um, for those of you who are on the webinar, you can see it's question two here. So the RFA does um, have some language in there that applicants should obviously justify the proposed clinical, con clinical conditions that they plan to study. Um, NIH is, is relatively agnostic about, you know, one versus multiple 
um, conditions. And so, you know, we recognize that really this is a judgment call on the basis of the investigators. Um, the optimal balance, of course, um, needs to be considered in light of the scientific questions that your investigative team is most um, uniquely poised to answer. So um, that's one example. Um, I will just sort of um, scroll down and, and let people know that we have um, additional clarifications on the sample size, um, the um, um, data integration aim, and then we have some very specific questions about um, the stakeholder engagement plan and um, whether they need to be formally included, and then some other questions about um, applicants who um, are in, interested in applying for the clinical site and the coordinating center or who are currently new investigators. So I'll stop there. Um, this is a time to unmute your lines if you have a question, um, and, and we'll, we'll do the best we can to allow one at a time to speak. Any questions? Okay, can we provide an example of a stakeholder engagement plan is um, one question that a, a participant's asking on the chat. So, you know, I, unfortunately, I, I don't have a plan ready to share with you. Um, one thing that I would encourage people to do who aren't as um, familiar with these, we, we have been having conversations with PCORI, um, and they have been extremely helpful in sharing examples of stakeholder engagement plans. Um, they are, of course, for a different purpose, but one thing we can do is um, provide a link on the FAQ so people can um, perhaps um, consult those and, and determine what features may be related to their specific aims. Yeah, I would, I would just add, Lucia, that if you do go to look at PCORI's plans, uh, they are much more in-depth than we uh, acknowledge that we will be able to do and we expect you all to do. Uh, they do engagement at every turn. Uh, and uh, we're not expecting that level of depth, but at least some of the, the sort of topics uh, and, and sort of methods, I think, are there. Good point. Other questions? Hello? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a question regarding what I consider somewhat of a gray zone, where obviously um, evaluating the clinical utility of, in, in our case, uh, potentially clinical whole exome sequencing. And of course, this is done in clinical practice, and we're looking to see the impact of this uh, on clinical utility. But the question I have is regarding the budget and kind of what is covered by what. The research itself is, in fact, investigating this use of a clinical tool, which in and of itself is something that is considered uh, a billable process. I'm just wondering if the NIH has any sense of whether all efforts uh, in these initiatives should be covered by the research budget, or is it appropriate to use clinical resources and, you know, redirect the budget, if you will, to assessing downstream of that? Okay, so that, that's a good question. So um, the, the, the short answer is, Costs that are needed to generate the data um, in, a, in a research setting or, you know, a, a clinical setting are allowable. Um, an approach in which an institution, for example, already has a process that they may be able to use to generate data for CSER II, of course, may not need to request costs in the CSER budget. And so if you have an existing process by which you're going to generate data, make sure you describe that in your application. Um, you know, people who aren't in that position who need costs to generate clinical sequencing data or um, require an investigators on their team to generate the data should obviously budget for those costs. Does, does that help? Okay. Sorry, I went back to mute, it mute again. Oh. It did clarify things. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Can, can I ask a related know? question? Sure. Uh, so sort of converse to that is, uh, um, data that is generated in a research setting so would still be considered to be responsive in terms of assessing clinical utility, even if it's not done in a CLIA-certified environment? 
Um, okay, so I, I'm going to actually just responding quickly, try and, and um, take tease out two components. So, so you know, obviously research data is part of this research consortium. So, you know, NIH funds um, scientific research, and so it's completely appropriate for the data that's generated um, as to Caesar uh, from Caesar to be considered research data, clinical research data, but research data. Um, now, I, I sort of heard a question about whether the research should be generated in a CLIA setting. And, you know, I think given the, um, given the goals of the RFA, I am finding it difficult to think of a situation in which you would not generate research um, findings in a, in, in a, in a CLIA setting. Um, I, I think, you know, interpreting variants and returning them to participants, um, the standard of, of care currently really is CLIA, so I think you'd have to have you know, a very strong justification for not um, using that approach. Okay, thanks. So we'll take a question that came in via um, the email for cancer focused applications about RNA sequencing and is that allowed? Okay, so um, just we want to say that with the, with the RFAs, we're encouraging the comparison of genomic sequencing approaches um, to alternative modalities, but with the preference for established modalities such as standard of care or targeted gene sequencing panels. So we you know to the extent RNA sequencing is already being used, then it's perfectly fair to have that as be one of the, your comparators with um, genomic sequencing. So inclusion of other genomic approaches generally is permitted as long as um, the justification relates to the genomic approach um, to a specific aim in the RFA. And then the second part is, is somatic and that sequencing allowed? So, of somatic only sequencing. So, we would encourage in the RFAs um, germline, germline sequencing. So, germline somatic integration is something, you know, that we put in our NCI priorities. Um, for somatic only, I think you'd have to have a very strong justification, and so we would prioritize germline and somatic over that. Yeah, I think there are, this is Dave, uh, I mean, in terms of LC issues, I think there are some interesting ones as we think about um, differences in both physician and um, physician laboratory and uh, patient treatment of, of uh, an understanding of germline versus somatic findings, so uh, there there may be a, a lot of richness there if you are thinking about doing both. And just a quick clarifying, um, so we would prefer germline somatic. Um, that isn't to devalue just germline sequencing, so we would accept that, but again, for any of these projects, really, they need to be scientifically strong and justified, um, scientifically justified um, as and responsive to the RFA. So that if you have specific questions, we're more than happy to talk to you about your particular project. I have a question regarding particularly in pediatrics populations, uh, how the NIH might view the appropriateness of whole genome as opposed to whole exome sequencing in a clinical context. Uh, this is clearly something that is starting to emerge, but is probably not considered mainstream by any stretch in this setting. Is that something that you would consider reasonable? So, if, if you look at the definition section in which we describe what we mean by genome sequencing, you'll notice that both whole exome and whole genome um, approaches are included in that definition. And, and so, you know, I think this is another one of those cases where um, I think it's somewhat of a scientific judgment call depending on what specific disease focus your group is planning on setting. There may be settings in which um, one of them is, is uh, you know, more valuable than the other, or perhaps, you know, one, it's probably more, more likely that one is more cost um, effective than the other. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think for, as, as a broader statement to, to all applicants, please, you know, do read the definitions and make sure you understand um, what we consider to be genome sequencing, but really the choice of technology is, is a judgment call on the basis of, of the PI and his or her team. Okay, so um, three second rule of, of silence here. Let's let's go ahead and go to another question that we've gotten via the WebEx. Um, regarding the data integration aim, um, number three, 
what scale is referred to for a healthcare system. So for example, as a single site community health center, would that constitute a healthcare system? Um, and so I think the answer there is, is, is yes. I think you, as long as you can sort of relate it back to the goals of the RFA, um, the exact healthcare setting can be fairly broad. And in fact, we are encouraging folks to think beyond specialized academic medical centers um, in terms of um, evidence generation for CSER II. And in, in objective three, you'd need to be able to show that you've got in in that uh, community healthcare center that you've got some, you know, some data integration issues that you're going to try to address. Okay, so then we have a question. Um, sorry. Does the reference to clinical laboratories refer to routine diagnostic testing as opposed to clinical sequencing laboratories in Objective 2? And in Objective 2, when we're talking about the intersection between the, the providers, the, fam the patients and their families and the clinical labs, we were primarily referring to the clinical sequencing labs in the, in the context of, of that. Mm -hmm. If you have other um, routine diagnostic testing that play labs that play an important part in your specific application, then that would be something that you would want to also include in that. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's like who are the main players that are involved in the, that clinical interaction. interaction. Um, so the next one says, in clinical domains where exome sequencing is already moving into clinical care, is it responsive to compare alternative approaches to exome sequencing, or is it necessary to compare sequencing to non-sequencing modalities? So I think the, um, the expectation in the RFA is to have one or more sequencing modalities compared to alternative modalities. So the alternative could be um, another uh, genomic modality, or it could be an, a, a non-genomic or non-sequencing modality. I think that's a, a judgment call on the basis of the, of the investigative team. With studies that explore the utility of clinical genome sequencing and risk assessment and prevention be eligible? Yes. I think, yeah, I, I think so. I think um, whoever asked that us that question may want to give us some more details or, or contact us, but I, I think more broadly, yes, I think, you know, as long as a study um, addresses the goals of the RFA and makes a compelling case that understanding clinical utility is important in that setting, I think risk assessment and prevention could be, um, could be relevant. So the next question asks whether or not hospitals or groups partnering with a co commercial genomic yeah. sequencing company to do the sequencing would be eligible or responsive? Yes, so the answer is, is yes. You'll, of course, need to describe the, um, the site that will do the sequencing, um, and then in the RFA, um, address a number of um, specific metrics that are related to the genome sequencing costs. But yes, it would be um, permissible to allow a private uh, commercial company. Okay, we have one technical question. Will the slides from today be made available? Uh, yes, they will. The slides and the webinar with the audio will be made available. For diversity sites, is ancestry marker testing required or expected? Um, we did not have any explicit requirements. Um, I think um, you'll want to, if, if you are proposing this, you'll want to describe um, the use of it and the rationale. Given the definition of sequencing in the RFA, do the diseases or phenotypes need to be associated with, one, with more than 100 genes? So, you know, in the definition, we um, really were basing the genome sequencing test strictly on the technology. So I, I don't think we, we said that they had to be linked to like an individual phenotype that was associated with more than 100 genes, if I'm understanding the, um, the question correctly. But the, the sequencing technology used, if it is a targeted gene sequencing panel, needs to include 100 or more genes. And I think more broadly, this what is not going to be responsive or in scope is if you were planning a project where your sequence, the sequencing component only sequenced one or five or 20 genes. We really need one of the two arms in the comparator 
to, to do a broad look at the genome, be it a genome, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, or a large gene panel, which we mm -hmm. use the 100 genes as a somewhat arbitrary but important distinction to help determine what is meant by a large gene sequencing panel. Let's pause and see if anyone else wants to chime in with questions. We have, we have a number of other questions that have been asked. Okay, moving on. What are the distinctions for CSER2 versus Emerge and Ignite? So some of you may be aware of other NHGRI-funded consortia, um, and this question has to deal with uh, deals with the um, scientific um, overlap between among them. So just as sort of a, a very high-level summary, CSER2 is focused on studying the clinical utility of genomic sequencing, performing research around the clinical encounter between patients, physicians, um, families, and labs and addressing barriers to integrating genomic, clinical, and healthcare data within healthcare systems. So that, that's what we just discussed. Hopefully that will sound familiar. IGNITE is focused on demonstration projects for clinical tests with established clinical utility. So the program's um, working on incorporating genomic information from these tests into the EMR and developing clinical decision support for implementation of, again, these um, tests that have established clinical utility. And they're also focused on dissemination in ways that are um, complementary but distinct to CSER II. Um, and then EMERGE, in its third phase, is focusing on assessing the penetrance and phenotypic implications or rare variants <coughs> of clinically relevant genes, integrating gene variants into EHRs, and creating community resources. Um, so that's the high-level overview. And then one more comment is that, you know, we recognize in these large interdisciplinary grants, um, there may be people that um, are thinking about applying who can leverage one or more data sets, whether they're from either of the consortia that I mentioned or not. Um, and I, I do want to point out that it's important in your um, application to, to distinguish um, what your um, research that you're proposing for funding, how that would differ from research that's already funded. Um, and if you're proposing to use data that have been generated through other consortia, uh, make sure you take a look at the section on using existing or retrospective data. Um, we have a number of um, items that, that really should be addressed to help re reviewers evaluate whether the data can be useful for use in CSER II. Another question that was uh, written in, uh, for the ethnically for the ethnic diverse sites, is it enough to be doing the research in a diverse setting, or is it, is it expected that implementation in a diverse setting will be a central focus of the research itself, that is, versus looking at genomic, just the genomic diversity of, of the patients? Um, I think that uh, we would... Um, while we can't require uh, that, that uh, an application focus on the implementation in diverse settings, it is uh, a very strong interest, and um, uh, we would, we I think are going to be inclined towards uh, studies that that mm -hmm. you know can do do both, and and uh, not just check the box of, of recruiting and sequencing people, but uh, learning how how to do this mm -hmm. in, in other populations. Hey. And as you look at the description of some of the, the discussions about ELSI-related issues around the in the diverse, diversity-enhanced RFA, you will see that those wouldn't really be able to be addressed if the implementation, as well if the implementation was not happening in that context. Yeah, I mean, it would be a, really a lost opportunity if you were doing research in a diverse population not to really use that to address the LC questions and unique issues that may come up with, with diverse populations. And, and I mean, I think just looking in objective one and objective two, uh, I mean, um, whether clinical utility differs in, uh, in other healthcare settings and other populations would be interesting and important, and whether the interactions between family members, providers, and, uh, and laboratories in these settings is, is at all different. and, and Needs and you know needs additional work. Mm -hmm. I think would be a rich area to explore. Is our 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. At the same time, I, I just want to point out, I think implementation is sort of a spectrum, and yeah. um, we don't want to discourage. So, so you know, I will say I think there there is sort of a um, a niche that needs to be filled in terms of recruiting participants and investigators from settings in which you know we don't see a lot of participants currently, and so you know, that that shouldn't discourage people from trying to take you know um, collaborate in those settings and mm -hmm. recruit patients from those settings, but. We do want to emphasize that the focus is implementation, and so make sure that you know if you're initi initiating a collaboration in one of these kind of more novel areas that you tie it to implementation. I mean, I think with that said, we don't want to discount the value of of learning more about genomic genomic diversity. Yeah. Um, you know that is clearly a, a, an added benefit as well, and so that is something to to speak about. I, I liked what you said, Dave, about sort of going beyond sort of the checkbox. Yeah. diversity approach, so. Other questions? So we're Scrolling through all the questions that we've gotten um, submitted via the WebEx, I think we've gotten through all of them. Um, if the questions slow down from the group that's called in, I think what we'll do is the, the NIH staff will stay dialed in for another five minutes or so in case people happen to think of questions. So um, if you do have questions or thoughts, please share them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, one more question about the um, the, the definition of diversity. Um, to establish diversity, does self-identification as a specific race, ethnic, et cetera, group count? Um, so can, uh, any way to make that bigger, Christine? So, so I do want to point out um, in the RFA, we have a definition section, um, which is highlighted here in, in yellow, and we do have a very specific um, definition of diversity. And I want to point out this is extremely relevant for those of you who are applying for clinical sites um, because the 25% and 60% minimum um, thresholds for recruiting diverse participants will be evaluated in relation to this definition. So you can see here that um, those patients can be defined according to uh, racial or ethnic minority populations, underserved populations, which relates to the definition immediately below this one, or populations who experience poor medical outcomes. So just keep in mind, you will have some number of patients that you're planning to recruit for CSER to um, either 25% or 60% of those per, uh, participants, depending on which RFA you're applying for, need to meet this definition. So there's been some general questions about the relative emphasis of cancer versus non-cancer or the number of cancer applications that we would expect. And we're not coming into this with any quotas or specific expectations for, en for different disease types. We will, of course, take into consideration programmatic balance. We, you know, we don't want to wind up with all of the sites focused on the same type of disease or broad category of disease. Um, but I don't think that there, the only reason we would potentially be considering cancer differently than we might consider cardiovascular disease as a group or, or infectious disease as a group or whatever disease group you want to choose is because we are partnering with NCI. And so that opportunity of co-funding does give, you know, as um, opportunity to consider, you know, bringing NCI in as collaboration, but the NCI co-funding is not 100% directly tied to the number of, of applications we would fund, and it will be dependent on what quality of applications we get and the diversity of different disease types that wind up being, being submitted and, and, and reviewed and, and hitting the other programmatic criteria. Okay, I think there's a, a request for a clarification. Can we rely on participants' self-identification as Hispanic, AA, et cetera? There are other approaches. I think that's allowable. I think, yeah, we recognize there are different approaches. Yeah, again, I mean, I think, you know, recognizing the limits of self-identification and, and mm -hmm. you know, the need for 
for care in, in the way that you ask those questions. But Okay, we're slowing down with questions here, so maybe this would be a good time to point out that we are requesting letter of in, letters of intent by July 5th. Um, these are not obligatory, but um, it does help us plan for the review, so please consider sending one in if you plan to develop an application for any of the RFAs. Um, and then the application due dates will be August 5th, um, 2016 by 5 p.m. local time of the applicant organization. Um, we do have a separate application due date for AIDS applications. If you are planning on submitting an AIDS application, please contact me offline so that we can discuss your application and that AIDS due date will be September 7th. Okay, so I think unless we get questions in another minute or so, we will um, start winding down the call and get ready to sign off here. Last call for questions. Okay, I think we'll wind down the webinar. Thank you to everybody who dialed in. Um, we're very much looking forward to hearing um, and seeing the ideas that the community comes up with. We're, we're all very excited about Caesar 2 here, and we hope that you are too. Um, thanks again, and, and feel free to reach out with additional questions, and, and we'll update the FAQ. Okay, thanks everybody for joining. Bye.